Hello and welcome to Finish, Finish Big. Big. We are on camera, on camera. Yep, we are listening our way through all of the Big Finish That's in right. more or less release order. A whole catalogue, everything you name it. Earth Search. Is that it? Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> Earth Search. That's all. <laughs> Judge Dredd. Anyway, I love Judge Dredd. Do you know, Benny Summerfield, Survivors. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, the, what's the one with Clara and Amy? Clara and Amy. Yeah. The one you love by Simon Gurria. Graceless. Clara. The works. There's nothing we won't cover. You know. No. Um. But we are back to the Doctor Who main range this week. Yes. With three very interesting stories we're in 2003 which is the big experimental year the 40th anniversary year was it 40 yeah Doctor yeah, 40, 40. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 and Gary Russell said because he tweeted us when we put mm. out to the hoes hello hoes to uh, for information and opinions far too many opinions just hold them back a bit next time alright I'm joking that he was going for a deliberately experimental approach with 2003 good. stories yeah. so he was trying to push the boat out to see mm. just how far Doctor Who could stretch in the audio <laughs> format <laughs> well we will find out about that won't we and it turns so... out it stretches quite far <laughs> <laughs> well, shall I tell you what stories we're talking about today mm. they are Creatures of Beauty I think that makes you ugly. Project Lazarus. Artemis, you're fired. And Flip Flop. I want to give you my Christmas present. <laughs> oh, no. oh, <laughs> that is a line. I know, I know it is. <laughs> so one of each doctor, which is nice. Mm. No, two... Sylvester McCoy stories. Well, sort of. I mean, very, I did want to ask you about the experimentational nature of these stories, which we will cover as we go through. One story which is told in the wrong order. Then you've got a multi-doctor story that isn't a multi-doctor story, so that's doing something new. And then you've got a story where there's two discs and you can listen to them in either order. My question to you is this before we go. Is, do you, is it too much to have all these in succession? Is it too much experimentation and not enough sort of, you know, traditional Doctor Who? No, because they've already tried the traditional ones, you know, Sirens of Time, Whispers of Terror, Land of the Dead. They've done those. And this is where, yeah, they can experiment. And it's something different every month. And you don't know what you're going to get. So I think it's it's better than just having the same old box sets every month. I, just, Doctor. I do remember getting these at the time because I think in these early big finishes I was really excited to have stories that felt like they were stories that could have been on the TV mm. and none of these did and I did like all these stories don't get me wrong because I did the reviews you know, later but I remember thinking oh, okay there's a lot of this and not a lot of Phantasmagoria you know yeah, I know, but trouble that is now matter. it's all fantastic. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's I no know, experimentation. I, know. I think so. this is great, and it just, uh, yeah, it just does something a bit different with the characters, you know, because we had quite a lot of you know Fifth Doctor and Nissa stories already. We've mm. done the traditional thing. Now let's do something different. She's gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I think Nissa is? What? Beauty, 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 <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> well, okay, speaking of which, let's talk about Creatures of Beauty. Oh, please, can we talk about Creatures of Beauty? Well, this was released in May 2003. This features David Dacre and Gemma Churchill. Oh, I don't even say who it stars. Well, we all know who it stars, don't we? Peter Davison and Sarah Sutton as the yeah. fifth Doctor and Nyssa at it if you believe Dylan <laughs> Reese. <laughs> oh god don't start um, and of course this was wonderfully put together by that triple threat Nicholas Briggs written directed and music by the man himself he's become an auteur by this point oh isn't he, he is isn't he if only he was producing as well and he would be <laughs> oh, producing on eventually second. this is a good one for Nicholas Briggs no, no I'm gonna say yeah I will say that it is a truth known universally that that is a quote in the style of Jane Austen that Nicholas Briggs has come in for some criticism from Finish Big 
over the many years it's been going. Well, since Sirens of Time started. Uh, yes, I believe I started that very first episode by saying it's ghastly. And you were like, oh, we can't start with it's ghastly, please. And But then we've had a few bits and bobs that we have quite like Dalek Empire. Oh, yeah, Dalek Empire. It was his magnum opus, wasn't it? Is that what it could call it? Magnum opus? <laughs> is that what they call it? Well, it is now. Has he got one yeah. of them? <laughs> magnum opus. <laughs> It's one of the fucking dictionary. Um, and um, we also quite like the mutant phase as well. Or I did anyway. Mm, you were yeah, a bit less keen on that one. Um, But this is something very special and indeed. If anyone's going to push the boat out and do something a bit different, I wouldn't have expected no. to be <laughs> Nicholas Bloody Briggs. Not in a million years. <laughs> but now... I wouldn't expect it of him now. No. But back in the day... Well, I think he had a bit I more time on his hands, didn't he? His creative juices were... Still wet. Spurting all yeah. over the place. Yeah. 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 He wasn't uh, as doing a million things at once. I he think just Dalek Empire inspired him a little bit. I think the reaction to that and the mm. fact that he'd brought something out that he basically had a vision for and done himself, it, it gave him the confidence to go, all right, now I can just write my ultimate mm. Doctor Who story. Well, this... About, I mean, when you think about Creatures of Beauty, you think about the, the narrative structure. Because yes. it's all over the place. That mm -hmm. is its USP. Yes. And it's interesting that Nicholas Briggs, and you know that Eighth Doctor Authors CD, he was the only one that was like, Oh, yeah. I don't want to push, <laughs> I don't want to do something different with the characters. I don't want to do, you know, develop the Eighth Doctor into something else or see where it can go. I want to tell a traditional story, but see how we can tell the traditional story in a different way and he has done just this hasn't he what tell a traditional story yeah because if you put this way. in order it is your standard what? doctor who story I mean, this is it's a story chopping it that and changing makes around. the doctor responsible good. for an environmental I know, disaster I know. that affects millions of people i wouldn't say that's entirely traditional yeah but it, it's if you put it in order it's having it in different order and piecing it together as you go along yes that's, that's what, what makes this, makes this unique here yes. And am I right? I did. I might have had a peek in your book. Mm. I know I might have you, stolen a fact from excuse you. Excuse me, I do that. <laughs> am I right in thinking that, that. <laughs> they, it was recorded at least? I'm not sure. Written, recorded in linear order, in story order, and then it was chopped up afterwards. No, it was recorded in the order it was written. Really? Yes. Oh. I don't know what you've been reading. I said that on Tardis Wiki. No, that's bullshit. Well, it doesn't say anything about that in Benjamin what? Cook's. Magnum opus. Well, it references it. Big finish the inside Maybe it story. Was in here. I mean, I'm going to have a look in the CD case while you carry on with some <laughs> facts. Give us some facts about this. Well, okay, so I've got some trivia about this story which I would like to bring to you. So he's asked, did Creatures of Beauty, uh, did he write it out of order or did he write it in order and then jumble it all up? To which Nick Briggs responds, when you look at the movies, read books or even listen to people telling you a story of something that happened in their life, you begin to realise how abnormal it is to tell a story in chronological order. I didn't ever write Creatures of Beauty in chronological order, I wrote it in thematic order. The theme of the play is moral ambiguity and the difficulties that occur when the whole picture isn't clear. I wanted that reflected in the structure. If you were to put the scenes in chronological order, you discover that there are huge holes in the narrative. I don't mean holes in the plot, but the advantage of telling a story that is uh, this way is that you can avoid certain rather tedious things that you'd have to go through if you were writing it in chronological order. If you position the scenes correctly, the audience will fill in the gaps almost without realising. For example, we don't need to hear the Doctor and Nyssa getting into a caterpillar tracked vehicle that takes them to Katim's spaceship because we know right from the start that they get to it. So I see what he's saying there. Because he's telling this out of order, because he's showing the consequences before the actions, you don't have to do the usual A to B stuff that you do in a Doctor Who story that's... Forget, well, he didn't quite say fucking tedious, but it is fucking tedious. But that's what he writes a lot of now, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> that's He's all he writes mind. now. And I will say, you know, this is going to be a massive sort of stroking of Nicholas Briggs. But <laughs> he tried this again with Ravagers, which is another non-linear story. And it is an abject failure. Like, why didn't he listen to this before doing that? Did you follow this? Yeah, listening? completely. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. I thought this I really was liked very, it. I, very clear. I don't think I had followed it a hundred percent before, but on a couple, on this second listen, 
absolutely i really enjoyed it well it's re- it's really quite simple it opens up and you've got these characters on this planet called katim katim and the katim all the people that live there have been affected by an environmental disaster that's made them disfigured and ugly and the only people that look normal are the rich people isn't it they've been able to have sort of um, surgery that's made them look like you and I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty people um, uh, and you've got David Dacre's character who's this horrible sort of law enforcer from the Absolute Time Warrior Iron Grant total sleazebaggy yeah. isn't he he's horrible look at his picture in the CD insert what? he's learning someone's crotch there <laughs> some baby old man David Dacre oh, get off someone's oh crotch dear. Oh, he looks very happy, doesn't he? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, it's a masterful performance. He's absolutely terrifying, David. David yeah, he plays those kind of characters really well. It's like, but the idea, the right? idea is, it's made this this culture of people incredibly xenophobic. So if anybody appears, they feel like they are. If anyone's on the planet that isn't them. They think it's the Velm that caused this terrible disaster. So when the Doctor and Nyssa appear, they think that they are Velm spies mm. and they are tortured and treated in the most, well, unpleasant fashion. And the way the narrative's chopped up, I don't think we get like the, you know, your traditional TARDIS landing and Doctor no, and Companion. How refreshing. Well, no, I think you get that in like later in part Episode two. Three, yeah. Because like Nyssa's already like captured in part one and interrogated. And that, those are the scenes that stood out for me when. Nissa is being interrogated. It's brutal, isn't it? It's pretty horrible, mm. isn't it? You understand the seriousness of the charge? I understand that your thugs jumped to conclusions and didn't give me a chance to speak. Some might say that was understandable, given the circumstances. Understandable? You've been sent to me because you made certain assertions at the time of your custody processing. I'm the senior psychiatric interrogator. I want to know... Why you said those things? Psychiatric? You think I'm mad? Uh, you mentioned that you weren't from this planet. You were just here on a short stop. Well, the doctor waited for the TARDIS to... Uh, and then the officer said you became very garbled. I was suffering from a concussion. Your officers knocked me out. I'd only just regained consciousness when they started asking me questions. The arresting officers report that you became violent at the scene of the crime. As I recall, there were at least four arresting officers, all of them considerably bigger and stronger than me. The only violence came from... Do you wish to make an official complaint against these officers? I wish to be released so So that... So that you could return to the... uh, the TARDIS. Yeah, and I think... Sarah Sutton responds to oh, all of that brilliantly. I think this is her strongest performance oh, so um, far oh, that we've got to. But maybe spare parts. She has some great oh, scenes. No, but this, this, uh, there's a bit more meat going round here. Well, she's got meatier scenes in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, kudos to Briggs for taking a character that is, you know, and likes Nissa, but that nobody really loves, and just giving her she holds stellar her material. She's, yeah, yeah, she's, keeping it some. And then you've got Pete Davidson in there as well, who, when he's angry, he's so great, isn't mm. he? Well, like, when he's sort of morally upright and, and vicious, like he is in this, because he's coming up against this society that basically they just want to kill him, don't they? They want to mm. interrogate them and kill him. What I really loved about this story, beyond how they're treated, which is very sort of um, mid 80s. Oh, of course, you know, captured, violent, spies. Yeah. You know, we're going to kill you, your spies, who are you working for? Yeah. But in a sort of violent like way. Like Nissa gets the Caves of Androzani treatment, in a way. Yes. Yeah. But what I loved about this story was the class differences between mm. Gilbrook and what's the lady's name? Lady Fawlian. Mm. Uh, who's had the surgery to make herself look pretty and the scenes between them two were out of this world the acting in those scenes where you know he's basically saying you might have the money to make yourself look pretty but I still think you're ugly the Mm. way you behave and what you do and then it transpires what she's trying to do is make it so future generations of their people don't have the sickness from the environmental Mm. poisoning because we don't get the reasoning that everything that's been going on until like episode three is like the explaining episode where they go back and they say what's happening and it all starts to piece together yeah. only around that time well, everything else is a bit you can follow it and it will go from i don't know there's gaps in the story that you're waiting for 
and then it finally starts to tie together. And that's quite satisfying. I it's think done really well. Despite the, way the fact that it's, the it's not done. in it, it's very clear yeah. what's yeah. happening in the story. Because the story is not overcomplicated, if you put it in order, like you say, it's not complicated. Mm. The only complication really is in the order that it's told. But I think somewhere in episode three when the Doctor starts going, you know, what, Nissa, I don't think we had any impact at all on this society. Mm. That's when you start to think, oh, shit, they absolutely have had an impact. And then it's not until the very last scene where that quote comes in again from the Doctor. Yes, and you realise the TARDIS is responsible yeah. for it's the all about environmental consequences, disaster. Isn't and it? that's a bold move to make, to say that the Doctor just passing through this... <laughs> yeah, it's all his fault. Basically, what happens is, yeah, yeah. this whole disaster is just because the TARDIS was going through and they that, have no idea that makes that them right then, didn't it when they're interrogating him and treating him terribly yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is their but nobody realises can and they, we please say it is an accident yeah, they never know do they they no. just go off like you say he ends up going yeah. yeah we didn't make a difference and it's actually you created that whole disaster and I don't think that's done before in any story. I can't think of any other similar thing in a well, story. Well, or if it was, you wouldn't avoid the drama of the Doctor knowing. Yeah. The the, the great thing about this is that he never knows. Yeah. You know, so he goes off swimmingly. What's his next story? The game or something, isn't it? <laughs> and he starts that story not knowing he's created this you know poisonous Same atmosphere way. on film. Um, do you know, there's a very funny quote here from Nicholas Briggs saying, um, a very, very few people sent their discs back genuinely believe in them to be faulty Ra- really? and then he says rather cruelly that makes me shriek with laughter <laughs> <laughs> oh you are a cruel beast Nicholas Briggs well you could, could I, has anyone tried that to put their CD on shuffle can they do that nowadays uh, and it goes out of order what this story yeah <laughs> no because I do think it is specifically positioned I don't think it's the I sort of story you, where you There is a big Finnish person out there. There's a big Finnish fan out there who's edited the story back into its normal order. I bet you somebody's done that. Yeah. That would be a good experiment. Apparently, the only real changes that Gary Russell wanted was to have the words piss and bastard taken out of the script. Oh, well, of course, because that's what Nicholas Briggs thinks everybody talks like all the time in his stories. <laughs> Anyone saying piss or bastard in any of his scripts? Yeah, no, what are you talking you know, about? You know when he's doing that, you, you know, bastard. sort of Ryan mercenary type things. They'd all oh, have to say true. piss and bastard. Well, apparently, that's one, a 90s fan thing. One bastard made it in, and um, <laughs> he was. was <laughs> <laughs> but he was. Um, he he managed to put in sound effects of falling masonry, so you could barely hear it. Oh, really? Because <laughs> yeah, otherwise, Gary would go crazy. <laughs> Um, he does say one other thing as well that I think is very interesting is that he wanted to do a story set on an alien planet which is sometimes dodgy waters it, this doesn't Doctor seem Who. very alien though like the picture on the front it's like the Black Orchid house it's just that everything's got like a green tint in the sky I just imagine it fairly normal well what he says is one of the crushing limitations of Doctor Who is that you always know the Doctor is the cleverest person in the story in a way that bleeds through him more often than not having the moral high ground what he wanted to do was explore having him in a situation where he genuinely doesn't know who's right or wrong and in this situation everyone's behaving so appallingly you don't know who's right or wrong and can i just say a word for his direction in this as well though because i think briggs is one of the best directors they have and this has very carefully been put together and it's been very precisely cast and very skillfully scored. I, in terms of a listening experience, this is one of the best stories we've listened to so far. And it, I think it had to be done. I think he had to do everything. This is his, like you say, this alter is the best work. Thing he's ever he wouldn't written. let anyone get their hands on directing this. I can imagine that he's like, I'm writing this, I'm directing this, because I know exactly how it's going to go. Well, because it's got a big ego. Of course he does. You know, <laughs> A lot of the people in the creative team in the early days of Big Finish did. But I've got to say, I don't think he's written anything as good as this since. I'm willing to have that challenged as we go through, because maybe we'll find things well, that... Well, Dal- apart from Dalek Empire, obviously. Oh. No, no, I don't think... No, no, no. the first this couple of Dalek, Dalek Empire, Empire, I think. But if it was just in that order, wouldn't you? Th- would you not have that? It's the, the choppy nature of the narrative. Is that all it takes to make a Nicholas Briggs script amazing? No, but you say choppy nature. I, but also, I think, it's I the think themes of the script that you're saying as well. There's huge suspense in how this is structured, this story. Because we know terrible things are going to happen before they happen. And so you're waiting for them to Let happen. Let go of the knife! Oh, so great. Oh. 
That's why. <laughs> She's got a knife. <laughs> also, no. but also as well, I and I mean this sincerely. Yeah, I know I'm being a bit serious on this one, but it's because I really want to stress how good this is. Mm. The dialogue in this is superb as well. And, you know, I have been on other podcasts where I have suggested that Nicholas Briggs has not actually spoken (laughs) actual words because the dialogue in Ravagers was just Mm. atrocious. No, it it did feel very authentic here. He says... uh, You know what? He describes the... um, Whatever it is, the environmental disaster. So it's all of this um, destronic. It's like a gas or gas, some stuff going into the atmosphere. But he describes it as paint spilling across the table. Mm. So simple and so evocative. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I think this is flawless. Mm. Yeah, I think maybe the one flaw you could find in it is that it is obvious. The final twist is obvious, but then the Doctor not knowing is what makes that land. Yeah, I agree. So I just I can't I just can't complain about this on any level, which is annoying because I like doing that. I, I don't know how much I would go back and want to listen again and again once you've. It's I. It's a quite heavy story, in that yeah, way. It's dark as in hell. In that sense, it's so got people being wanna, tortured. Yeah, it's not one like a light, fun one you just put on as a. I don't know. You have to and you have to concentrate when you listen to it. I don't think you can be multitasking while you're listening to this one because of all the I think that's why I've never really what, followed it before what's wrong with that though I think you should concentrate when you're well, listening to audio dramas people do things while they're listening don't they well stop <laughs> <laughs> stop doing your ironing and listen to Nicholas Briggs <laughs> yeah. he's got some interesting things to say I do have a question for you though mm-hmm. which I've written down here in my notes how far can you go with sadism in Doctor Who because this is quite a sadistic story it does feature people being tortured and interrogated in quite a vicious way I, mean, I, do, I don't think it's up is to this too adult no, it's no, not no. Eric Sayward level yeah but you've got a woman I know you take the piss out of the scene you've got a woman going around with a knife literally slashing away at people like how far can you go with this stuff before it stops feeling like Doctor Who they wouldn't have put this on maybe they would have done in the 80s <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I didn't, it didn't stand go? out so bad it fits in with season 22 type of you don't think Gore. it's any further than that? I don't that. think it's any further than that, okay. isn't it? I mean, that is the worst scene. And yeah, this has been interrogated. She's not been, like, beaten up, is she? No, she is beaten well, like, up at one point. Okay. She is beaten up. Like, but you don't really hear <laughs> we, the, the, the story up. starts with her in a cell after she's been Yeah, I know, but it, it implies it and says it. You don't necessarily... You don't have that scene where it's like... Smash, you know. I wonder if it's the intensity of the performances then that really. Yeah, I me. think it is because David think... Dacre's a horrible person character oh, so that he plays. I'm sure he's a lovely person, but he does it so well, and that sort of misses innocent, and she just sort of takes it, doesn't she? She doesn't really stand up to it all. She's not strong enough she's not like a Tegan to stand up and shout back or anything she just takes it but she does have a steel in this she does she does but it's not a loud it's just more strong inside I think I think if this story was told in a linear way we'd say it's a perfectly acceptable very well acted story Mm, yeah it would still be a really good one how it is structured I think it is a masterpiece wow yeah, I, 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 this is Nicholas Briggs' masterpiece. And I, you know, I want to move on because I just don't want to say bad things because okay. I think it's wonderful. Interesting yeah. cover as well. <laughs> I thought the cover was a bit copy-paste. Well, it's early days still, It's, it's it? when you've got those terrible lines around the pictures, the publicity pictures of the Doctor and Nissa. Well, they've just been cut out, haven't they? <laughs> it's terrible. Just on the cover. I think it might be Lee Binding. Oh, no, Paul Burley. Sorry, Paul Burley. So, next we have... <laughs> Project Lazarus. How long was it going to take you to start <laughs> crying? <laughs> this was released in June 2003, starring Colin Baker as the Sixth Doctor, and Maggie Stables as Evelyn, oh, and yes. Sylvester McCoy as the Doctor. I mean, why would you take a Colin Baker and Evelyn story and ruin it by shoving in Sylvester McCoy? <laughs> No, I don't mean that. I'm getting increasingly fond of McCoy on audio. This uh, features Rosie Cavallario and Stephen Chance returning as Cassie and Nimrod from uh, Project Twilight. This was written by Mark Wright and Kevin Scott, directed by Gary Russell, with music by Andy Hardwick. I have some wonderful trivia about this one. So can I start? Okay, go straight into it. Can I start with the conception of this one? So, um, Kevin Scott says, We ran the pitch by Gary 
uh, we were after two commissions. They wanted to write two stories. We were in the pub, because I think that's where a lot of these uh, conversations take place, because Gary had taken us out for a meal to discuss why the church in the crown was so late, and Mark suddenly announced that he had no idea for the return of the forge. I blurted out my plans for another sixth Doctor and Evelyn story to be followed by a seventh Doctor one, and Gary went quiet. Dun, dun, dun. I looked at him and said, you hate it, don't you? Oh man, I've seen that look on Gary Russell's face, you know, when we're doing a commentary. Um, amazingly, he shook his head and said, I wonder if Jason will let me do a story with two Doctors in it. And a commission arrived out of the blue two weeks later. So this was going to be two separate stories, which they merged into one. So, and that's our experiment here, isn't it? Yeah, so you get the first two episodes is a Sixth Doctor and Evelyn, and the last two episodes is a solo Sylvester McCoy. I think the first half of this is stronger. Oh, well, it's the Sick Talk from Evelyn. No, 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 I don't think that's why it's stronger, though. I think it's... it's... Most of the plot happens in the first two (laughs) episodes. The trouble is with it is is the the second episode ends on such a dramatic high. Go on. Oh, he's (laughs) dead. Cappy's dead. Thank you. Oh, you can't tell me when jumping. (laughs) <laughs> the Oscar goes to <laughs> Mark Raw XXX. <laughs> da, 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 da. So this is picking up from Project Twilight, and if you remember, everyone, I was halfway through making a point there. Cassie oh. from Oh, sorry, what were you saying? <laughs> I asked you to do the quote, oh. and then you just took over. <laughs> Can I carry on? That the dramatic high point is at the end of episode two, mm. and. Everything that comes after that is a bit anticlimactic because there's nothing in three and four, even though there's some pretty violent and gross things. It's happening. just sort of just tidying up the plot that's happened. Yeah, like it feels like we've reached the climax yeah. mm. when Evelyn starts blubbing. Yeah. So Project Twilight, we left uh, Cassie, who will turn out to be Hex's mum. Spoilers, as a vampire, and the mm. Doctor promising to come back and find a cure my when he's Tommy, got a cure. My Tommy. So they're. F- so they go to find her, and it's been like two years because the TARDIS is wrong or whatever. Well, no, they did plan to go back to where they left her. Yeah, but, but she's moved. She's no, moved no, the TARDIS has a wobbler yeah, that's what and I just won't said. go back. Yeah. yeah, maybe it knows. It knows yeah. that all this is going to happen, so it takes them here. So Cassie's working with the Forge, and we meet the Forge again. That's a good twist. Don't skip over that. Well, no, yeah, it is. Cassie, it is. the, the she's reveal got that Cassie's working because that's the end of the first cliffhanger, mm. and that's great. Mm. She's sort of behaving a bit, you know, a total bitch. Yeah, because to Evelyn as well. Yeah. The Doctor brings Evelyn out. She goes, "Oh, what did you bring her for?" <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what accent that was. That's how she sounds like. But that. at the end of episode one, you know, Nimrod goes. Cassie has been working for me and the Forge. Yeah. God, that weren't bad either, was it? So the... If you need a Nimrod, <laughs> I'm here, big finish. So the reason we got Sylvester McCoy then, so what happens is basically at the end of that, it's a bit of a runaround. Cassie is killed. Yeah. They're looking for a little creature, aren't they, called the Hundra. The Hundra. I love the noise the Hundra makes. What does he make? It's coming towards you. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a really good. In- it's a scary moment. You're like, looking for foley eyes. Be finished. That is what they sound like. It's available. Because <laughs> it, it's like it's like this little sort of fairy thing, isn't it? And they, and they look watching in the forest. And when it gets angry and gets near it, it's like I have never heard such a disagreeable noise come out of your mouth. Do you know, and I've heard a lot of noises come out of your mouth. <laughs> So when Sylvester McCoy, the Seventh Doctor, comes back... So, yeah, they leave. Cassie's dead. Off the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn go. Evelyn's upset. And that goes into arrangements for war later on. That's right. That sets up this new yeah. arc for the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn. Amazing as well. What do you think? No, no, because we've had the death of Jem in Doctor Who and the Pirates. Mm. Now you have the death of Cassie in yeah. this. So, and it's ev- effectively doing the Tegan story from Resurrection of the Daleks, but well... Well, it's also doing the ace, too many people have killed, I'm going to call myself McShane story as well. What was, yeah, no, that was shit too. Finally, they're doing it with a character, one that we care about, two that's well acted, because it ain't Janet Fielding or Sophie Aldred. Yes, I got one in there somewhere. <laughs> and three, they tell Arrangements for War. Arrangements for War is what whatever came after Resurrection of the Daleks should have been for Tegan. It's that whole, I'm going to reflect on just how violent these stories are. Hmm. 
Oh, it's an incredible character. I can't wait to get to that. But we're not there yet. But no, but then when we have the Seventh Doctor's two episodes is more him coming up, mopping everything up. They've cloned the Sixth Doctor. So it's not actually well, no, we two don't, Doctors We don't know meeting. that to start off with, do we? We don't know straight we away. We think it is the Sixth we Doctor. We think it and is. Colin's and he's working for the it forge. initially. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, he walks in and goes, excuse me, you know, yeah. what's going on here? This is appalling. What kind of scientific ignoramus would have got... Scientific ignoramus? How dare you? What? I know that noise. Let me introduce our new scientific advisor. Doctor, meet the doctor. And, and then, when he's revealed to be the clone, though, how great is his performance? He's very good. Yeah, yeah well, he suddenly gets them, a bit they? snivelly and a mm. bit cowardly and a bit violent. But this is the first time we've had any kind of multi-doctor release since the Sirens of Time. Yeah, you it's know, better than Sirens of Time. They're ten a penny now, but this was a big event at well, the it's time. It's not a multi-doctor, is it? Well, if it's not, but it's two Doctors in one release. Right, I see what you're saying. And you could choose which cover. There's two covers. You yes. could have your Colin Baker cover or your Sylvester McCoy cover. Yeah, and as Lee Binding says in the Inside Story, that really is a naked sick doctor on the cover. Can you see him? Where? Oh, what, on the seventh doctor one, is it? No, I don't know. I've, I've got the sixth doctor one. I haven't got the seventh doctor. Apparently, there's a naked Colin Baker I mean, on there. I think that must be on the I no, can't see this, it. That, and then there's the composite of both of them. It's exactly the same to me. Well, who knows? No, it's not. Do you want to see Colin Baker naked anyway? <laughs> well, I don't think he's there, but we'll have to get our specs oh, out, won't yes. we? <laughs> I trust Lee Binding, all right? He knows about naked Colin Baker. Well, uh, that's the seventh doctor bit. There's no naked. Oh, what's that? Oh, no. It's Colin's ass. I don't know. Hang on, what's in here? Oh, there they are together in the side. Um, no, anyway. Anyway. I have another great bit of trivia here, though. <laughs> it's, it shows Gary Russell being a total bitch, and I always love that in this story. Um, Gary says, A nightmare of pre production. Their scripts came in, and they won't argue with this. If they do, they're idiots, he says. I went ballistic because I couldn't believe this was the same writing team behind The Church and the Crown. Project Lazarus was terrible. Uh, it, it was such a good idea for a story, but Cav and Mark delivered rank dialogue. Rank? Can you believe that? I didn't know whether to say, go back and start again. Bear in mind the pressure of time. What I did, in fact, was phone up Mark and say, get your ass round here. We're spending the whole of tomorrow rewriting this script from scratch. Actually, most of parts one and two were pretty much what they delivered. We just tarted up the dialogue and changed the location about a thousand times. Parts three and four, however... Mark and I did an awful lot of rewrites on because there just wasn't enough story to hold them together. And I'd say there still isn't. Yeah, Get your I mean, ass round yeah. here and rewrite these scripts. Yeah. God. It, yeah, as we said, those last two episodes are a little bit lacking. Yeah, well, th I, there's one sequence that I love where there's literally thousands of Colin clones, which have been experimenting mm, on in horrible ways. And it's an image you, know, you sort yeah. of would want to see on TV. <laughs> They're not Colin being tortured. <laughs> just because it's sort of weird yeah. and twisted, you know? Um, but you, what, you're not keen on this one? No, I am. It's, yeah, I just love those first two episodes. With It's always great with Six Doctor and Evelyn. But Sebastian McCoy, he's a bit subdued. He's playing his later, older Seventh Doctor. I don't know why you don't like that. I, I just don't like him on his own. He's just a bit boring. He's more brooding when he's on his own, yeah, I find. Yeah, but that's boring. Well, yeah, but usually he's saddled with Sophie Aldred. Where have you taken me now, old girl? You know when people say, like, when uh, a prestige actor, like, for example, Lindsay Duncan comes mm. along in The Waters of Mars. Right. And suddenly, you know, everyone ups their game. Even David Tennant ups his game because he's with a prestige actor. Mm. I feel like Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldridge is the reverse. <laughs> when Sylvester McCoy is on his own, he delivers great performances. But when he has an actress as bad as Sophie Aldridge next to him, unfortunately, his game dives. I think he comes down to her level, yeah. you know, and actually I think he can deliver. I think I, I feel like it's more of a stepping on point to go to arrangements of war. You need it's just it's quite functional in that way in that you need to have the Cassie stuff in order to get to the better stuff later on with the Sick Doctor and Evelyn. But this is a very important story in one respect. This is the first sequel to an original Big Finish story. Yes, of course. And obviously we'll get a lot more of that going yeah. on. But this is the first the time they did brilliant. that. brilliant. The Forge was there. Well, let's talk about important that. important thing. Because the Forge is essentially an even darker version of Torchwood, isn't yeah. it? Torchwood is, we're doing it for the English Empire, and we do the occasional bad thing, but mm. technically we're trying to save the Earth. The Forge is 
we'll do whatever it takes. We'll torture a thousand Colin Bakers mm. if we have to. <laughs> if we have to, you know, get the technology that we want. I feel like the Forge is a more interesting, dramatic prospect because of how far they go. Mm. Whereas Torchwood, oh, we haven't done any Torchwood ordeals yet, but I always feel like they're sort of on our side. Whereas I wouldn't well, trust the good guys, aren't they? I wouldn't trust like, the Forge no, at all. No, you don't all. trust them to do anything. You know, Nimrod's no. a, well, and they killed Cassie. Damn you, Nimrod. <laughs> Damn you, is what Colin Baker <laughs> says. <laughs> no, and I, I just want to say for that... Doctor, wh- where's Cassie? No, 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 that's not it. She goes, where's Cassie? <laughs> she does it. <laughs> not to begin with. Oh, Doctor, you can't just solve everything with a piece of chocolate cake. <laughs> Cassie's dead. They should have done that when Adric died. Oh God, I never knew. I was such a good dramatic <laughs> actor. The Oscar, give it to me, you bastard. I'm having it off you. Um, I do think that last five minutes at the end of part two mm. is That's one of so the... so uncomfortable to listen to. It's one of the dramatic highs so far it is, that we've it's had. Sort of, so I say half and half. I say the first half is excellent. The second half is okay. Overall, seven mm. out of ten is probably quite fair. Oh, and do we have... The doctor doesn't find out about her heart condition in this, or does she? Uh, he she doesn't. She gets the tablets at the end. That's but clever, we, though. Because she tells Cassie, doesn't she? No, no, Cassie knows because she can sense people's heartbeats. Right, that's she's it. a vampire. So, yeah, this is more. She can sense the, sort of the flow yeah. of blood and her heart's yeah. not moving. And then at the end, when she's in the room, sort of going, <laughs> you can hear the pills yeah, popping. Pills popping yeah. like, oh, oh. <laughs> Evelyn, just go away. <laughs> Oh, Evelyn. The most dramatic scene that's ever happened in the TARDIS. Ever. Yeah. And I'm, I mean. Side men shooting, whatever. Susan and the Scissors, nothing. No way. First Doctor and Barbara, no. I like, you do mock it, right? Everything. But it makes me really uncomfortable because I, you, Evelyn's like all of our grandmothers. I'd love and to see this it on is, TV. This is literally like what, listening to your grandmother yeah. have a breakdown, and that's <laughs> awful. It is worth it just for getting to that end of episode two. Uh, well, oh, one last thing I'd like to say, and that is, um, who's doing the music for this? Is it Steve Foxen? I believe. No, Andy Hardwick. Oh, Andy Hardwick, and you know he does the music for um, Zagreus. You know the previously oh, yes. on Doctor Who, it's like. Yes. I love that music. Yeah. Well, I thought his sort of um, dark music for this. They he keeps doing a bit where it falls down and goes. Ooh, mm. God, scary as Andy Hardwick was a hell of a find. I feel as if Mark Wright should have the final word on Project Lazarus, Okay, if you wouldn't mind. In terms of quality of script, I think it's the weakest of our three stories, mainly because there's a lot to cram in. Two Doctors tying up loose ends from Project Twilight. I think the concepts in the stories might act like a sleight of hand to hide the failings of the script. I think it's another love it or hate it story, to be honest. True. Well, if you can, if anybody finds the naked Colin Baker, <laughs> let us know. I'm squinting at this cover. I can't see anything <laughs> right now. It. I think we've got the wrong one. I can't believe we're playing Where's Wally for naked Colin He's Baker. He's not naked on the front. It's I'm the Tower look- of London, that ain't Colin <laughs> Baker. Oh, unless that's his penis. <laughs> I don't know why. Hang on. Oh. Anyway. Oh, um, there's a, in the Seventh Doctor one, what's that? Oh, in the tube. Is he in the tube? Yeah, yes, there's someone, there's in, the someone tube. in the tube. Do you think they uh, asked Colin to take his clothes you off? You have to get the Seventh Doctor one. I got the Sixth <laughs> Doctor one because I thought it was more of a Sixth Doctor story. <laughs> anyway. Look, if you want to see Colin Baker, there's a wonderful photograph of him with his chest out. His airy chest. Maybe they used that. He's got a big handlebar moustache. Have you seen it? Yeah. He looks like a porn star. It's fabulous. Right, anyway, let's move on. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So next, we have Flip Flop, released in July 2003. Starring Sylvester McCoy and Bonnie Langford. This features Trevor Martin. Trevor Martin? Yes. Of Curse of the Daleks fame? Yes. And or Richard... is that Seven Keys to Doomsday? Probably both, I don't know. Okay. And Richard Gibson. This was written by Jonathan Morris, directed by Gary Russell, with music by David Darlington. Can I say, there was a lot more actors than just Trevor Martin and Richard Gibson. I know, I knew. Why did you choose Richard Gibson two... over the two people that played he Stuart He was first in the cast list. Oh, fair enough. Now, this was very exciting, very different. So we have a little slipcase for this release. <laughs> you know, in terms of packaging, we're going we're going out there. And we have disc... Well, 
I was going to say disc one, but it, it doesn't matter, does it? So we've got black and white discs here. Yes. In terms Each of, in terms of uh, presenting this as an experiment, yeah, this is the best of the three. This is very out there. And you can play either black or white in any order. That and the story is still makes an sense. Ingenious How idea. Brilliant. That How is an ingenious amazing. idea. Although, Such a way. can I say something straight away? Oh, uh, here we go. Yep. I think the idea is stronger than the execution. Oh yeah, I don't think it would ever be flawless trying something out like no, this. I but it's trying. It to might do be in, in terms of plotting, it might be flawless. Yeah. But you know what my issue with this was? Well, it was I was spending so many time, so much time trying to figure out whether everything tied up that I actually wasn't enjoying the story. I was yeah. I was I was focusing so much on the plotting. I was, and then they were going, "Oh my god, someone's been executed." I said, like, "Were they?" I was trying to figure out how that tied into that and how mm. that affects that. Well, in the notes, Jonathan Morris says here, mm. this story is told over two CDs, one black and one white, the idea being that it can be enjoyed irrespective of whether you listen to the black one first or the white one first. Mm -hmm. Indeed, because you can listen to it in two different ways, you're effectively getting two stories for the price of one, and this release therefore represents excellent value for money. But it's not a puzzle to try and find out which way round is the proper or canonical way of listening to the CDs because there honestly isn't one. Oh, so there's no canonical way. Oh, the fans will be in uproar. Well, this all happened at the same time, don't no, they? No, I'm sorry. They like things. They like to... Yeah, like but you. the two stories are it's happening like at the same time. It's like you and your moment. You like knowing yeah, precisely yeah, what all that, of yeah, these things is, take yeah, place. It's one story. It doesn't matter, does it? And, well, we did it... What did we do? We did white. Oh, I can't remember what we did. No, we, we did, did white, white, white then black. Yeah. We did white then black, and that Actually, seemed to be the easier oh, way. I think because I think the white disc is the the better disc. What did what it did explains do? the concepts better? Well, you better head to Twitter now. We did put a poll out to Twitter to ask our fabulous hoes what order they prefer to listen to flip flop in. <laughs> and with 61% it was the black disc first yeah, so we I did it different right. I don't think no, that's right no I think it's because okay so the differences are I mean there's no right try and work this there out. is no right there is that because but you I can feel do like over. it's easier so in the the white disc that we did first it explains everything very clearly it is because we got this race called the Slithergies. I am a poor blind Slithergy. Who are like these blind slug creatures. Yes, more on them later. But And they are potentially invading this place, aren't they? Poxatwami? Mm -hmm. Poxatawny. <laughs> Poxatwami. Um, and oh, actually, it's set at Christmas time. Is this the first ever. Non Christmas Christmas special. Christmas special? Well, after the one doctor. It feel this very is a Christmas No, well, everyone talks about Chimes of Midnight. Yeah. Why not talk about Flip Flop being set at Christmas? Because well, we all forget. That's why. <laughs> yeah. So the Slithergies are potential invaders here, and they're not featured in the white disc, are they? No. At all. You don't meet them, and it's all the human stuff, and this time, and something about the president being killed, and these Be people want to go back in time and change history, so. Then the, the white the dish war doesn't opens, happen. doesn't it? With the Doctor and Mel landing, yeah. they've come from the spaceship Pinto to where quest, quash the quarks, quell, quell the quarks. We're attempting to quell the quarks. They need some leptonite crystals, which, which is on this planet. makes the quarks go berserk and explode. And um, they land, and there's already a security alert out for them. Yeah, when they land, and there's been a, a threat that somebody is going to assassinate the president. Well, we learn in the black disc, it's the doctor that lets them know mm. somebody is going to assassinate the president. Uh, so it's he who did it himself. Um, but it does set everything up well. There's Stuart and Reed, these two guards that sort of go on this and journey. And they travel with them. back in time with them, so they're in a bit of a loop. And then we're in this so, whole territory, this timey wimey territory of going back in time, to changing change the history. past, yeah. and then you get a whole new offshoot, a whole new universe with a different Puxatawney. Yeah. And eventually they change it to a point where on the black disc, the Slivergies are, are in charge. Well, they're they're on the planet. They've got segregated areas, and they are starting yeah. to invade. And then they want to go back, and they're like, "We didn't want this to happen. Now we want to go back and change, change what we tried to and change." And so you can go round and round and round and round. So then, at the end of yeah. the like the white disc, the Doctor and Mel are like, "Well, we need to sort it out." No, there's another Doctor and Mel on their yeah. way to sort it out, and it goes round like that. Every time the universe is branching off, another Doctor and Mel emerge, yeah. an alternative Doctor and Mel, and so that's the get out of this. Yeah. In that one Doctor and Mel can go off and have jolly adventures off to Paradise Towers or wherever they're going and then the other Doctor and Mel from the other offshoot universe can come in and 
save this, mm. but then they go off at the end of the next disc, and, the next and one et cetera, et cetera. There's it's constantly very, new universes yeah. popping into existence. Like It's very clever <clears throat> and fair to Jonathan Morris for plotting this out and making something like... I would... I can only really imagine his find study it so difficult. being covered I know. in post-it you notes. You really need to you know? carefully plot this out. And then, I think once you've got the basics, there's these little references, like the alarm, like the doctor sets off the alarm and then the alarm is going off in the next one. And, you know, you know that kind of there's thing. There's lots uh, of clever little bits, bits and pieces, and pieces like that. that. I mean, do you think Stephen Moffat, who I don't I mean, often mention very on Moffitt, Finish Big, it's very Moffitt, do you think it? he might have listened to this story? I mean, he and then love decided it, sure. to make six it's seasons very... of Doctor Who in this style. Well, Stephen Moffat, I think he did say once, and it's I think it's true that for a time travel show, there's not much time travel. Well, there's a lot in here, Doctor Who, lot and I like one. it when they do use it. Is it a a very a, you know an exciting story to listen to? No, because you're just enjoying the mechanics. I, I think it's a very standard story. I'm not particularly interested in a lot of the characters. That's the trouble. I don't really like there's, the Swiverties. There's so much plot. I'm there for the Doctor and Mel working things out, but apart from that... Apparently, Gary Russell actually said to Jonathan Morris, go and give this another pass because there's so much plot and there's not enough characters. So there was even less character stuff before. And I want to say, this is the first explicit sex scene in Doctor Who oh, <laughs> ever. Give me your Christmas <laughs> present. You can unwrap me. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that there was a bit is... out of character. Talk about things I didn't do on TV. Well, quite. Imagine that in season twenty-three or no, twenty-four. Do you know what? Right, <laughs> that, that whole sequence there is just made for for the point where Sylvester McCoy runs in and goes, "I will assassinate the president." <laughs> <laughs> that was a great cliffhanger. <laughs> but you know, the other issue I have with this was that tonally, it's all over mm. the fucking place. And I've written down here. You've got melodrama, which is this whole sort of having an affair. They're very over the top, aren't they? <laughs> oh, loved your voice, loved your body. Oh, Mark my. and I watch a lot of Neighbours, oh. and this is over the top. This is too over the top, even for Neighbours. There's some weird comedy in there as well that doesn't quite land. There's time travel hijinks. I mean, it's just all over the place. And it's trying to be this sort of atmospheric Christmas story as well. And spouting off the techno babble. Yeah, like, I mean, she does strange. it very well, but it's... Well, yeah, she is a really... computer programmer from yes, Peace Spotting. You know. She understands all the mechanics of it very well. Well, talking of the mechanics of this, can I give you a quote from Jonathan Morris, please? Oh, go on. That reads a little bit like the Star Trek technical manual. <laughs> oh, God. So I want you to tell me if this makes any sense. Because I was reading this going, oh, I'll have to read this up to Mark. See if it makes sense. Without wishing to get too technical, because I'll get something wrong, the idea is that if you travel in time to change the past, you'll be moving from universe N to, music, uh, to universe N plus one. There will be a version of you in universe N plus one that will travel in time and change the past in universe N plus two. It's an iterative process. As N tends to infinity, one of three things can happen. You can have chaos where each universe is subtly different from the one before ad infinitum. You can tend towards a single solution where... I mean, I've switched off at this point. I was like, if I need this much explanation to listen to this fucking story... This would be a good time for you to explain what you're up to. We're fighting for the freedom of Paxatoni. What? Just the two of you? As I told you before, the rest of our group was captured. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell us, Stuart, what's going on on Puxatawney? I'm afraid we're not very up on your history. You'll have to fill us in a bit. About 30 years ago, a spaceship arrived in orbit. It carried the Slithergees. They met with Bailey, our president. They claimed to be refugees. Yeah. Refugees who travelled in a heavily armed battle cruiser. They said their home planet had been destroyed and they needed somewhere to live. So Bailey had a choice. She could either accede to their demands or risk starting a war. And so she offered them a compromise? Yeah. She said they could have one of our moons. She betrayed us. Well, it sounds to me like she was trying to avert a war. We could have beaten them. But instead, she began a process of appeasement. She's a traitor. She should be dead. No, thank you. What I would like to talk about is the Slivergees. John, and now first of all, I'm going to quote Jonathan Morris, and then I'm going to ask you a big question. Okay. This is quite a big quote, but it's important, okay? So he says, Secondly, with the new adventures about in the 90s, Doctor Who became politically correct, all about how racism was bad, how intolerance was bad, how we should all learn to get along in perfect harmony, ebony, ebony and ivory, and so forth. But I remain unconvinced. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm getting all reactionary in my old age, but I'm not sure political correctness is necessarily a good idea. Now, wait, because 
this sounds controversial. It seems to be based on two presumptions. Firstly, that certain people in society are too feeble-minded to stand up for themselves and need special treatment. I agree with that. They don't always. Secondly, that certain people in society are so feeble-minded that they need to be told how to behave. I don't believe in discrimination, negative or positive, because it's divisive and unfair. But, well, every couple of months you get a whole load of nonsense written in the tabloids about asylum seekers. It's a contentious issue, a one that I wanted to write about, not in a bleeding heart sort of way. I wanted to write a satire of political correctness. Wouldn't it be funny, I thought, if you had a bunch of aliens that invaded planets not by force, but by turning up, pretending to be refugees and taking advantage of middle class guilt? Now, I said to you when we were listening to this, you would never, ever tell this story now a story of asylum seekers coming to a planet and going, oh, I'm poor, I'm blind, I'm disabled, being given a place on that planet and then slowly but surely you know, sucking up all the rights for themselves and then no rights, right? They say at one point like, 90% are like slivergy rights and only 10% for everybody else. You just wouldn't tell this story now, would you? No. Is that a bad thing about now or is or is this a bad thing that he's done then? You can take it at whatever level you want to. Can't if you, you want just aliens from if Doctor Who, if you just Who, want aliens enough, in a Doctor Who, but they are sp- explicitly said to be asylum seekers. Yeah, I don't think you'd be so explicit now. I think now, if this story was being told, it'd be written by a Tory, saying these asylum seekers mm, are coming yeah. over, taking over, and they're going to take all your rights mm. away from you. Uh, when I interviewed Jonathan Morris recently for Hamster, he said. I tr- I don't really want to talk about Flip he's Flop. changed his mind on it <laughs> well do you think? I think bec- I think this has aged very badly indeed but as an experiment as a comedic idea I kind of get it it's like those comedies in the 90s you know where they're pushing against all the political correctness but now if you listen to it you might wince just a little bit you know you might cringe yeah I think so I mean Jonathan Morris in the sleeve notes here says I'm certainly not the person I was back in 2001. The story has grown more serious and more silly, just as I've grown more serious and more silly. And we've both got a great deal more complicated, so I hope you enjoy it. It's a farce, political, satire, mystery, time travel, romance, tragedy, action, adventure, horror, comedy, just like my life of the last two years, except for the bit about time travel. (laughs) Which sort of sums it up. But that entire list of things that this story is there does go to prove I think there's a bit too much happening here yeah I I, I think like in terms of an idea it's brilliant in terms of how it's plotted it's flawless in terms of listening experience it's okay I did I zoned out before the end I was like at the beginning I was like right I'm on beyond how's this going on the doctor's assassinating the president these aliens are coming in to begin with but by the end I was like okay we seem to be going around in circles the the most exciting part is getting the two separate CDs and and choosing which one you're going to put in because yeah and once it starts off especially the Slithergies I just wasn't interested in them I didn't really like them. No, see, I think that as an idea, like, that's really I interesting. Don't, no, I don't. I, don't I just think, think the that. emphasis. The I mean, the idea now. Imagine telling a story now about an alien race that takes offence for everything. Like literally, it's a mm. comment on Twitter. It would God's be sakes. a different. You could tell it, but you have a different emphasis now. I think. Yeah. Or you'd show another side as well. You'd show more than two sides. You'd have the slithergy thing, but then you'd show some ridiculous politicians or something that you'd have to add a bit more in if you're doing it I'm nowadays. not suggesting somebody does this but I think if the wrong bleeding heart listened to this story now they might attempt to cancel Jonathan I don't think, oh, I don't think. and he it's, doesn't, it doesn't deserve, deserve it, it. Doesn't deserve because canceling. it's a comedy and it's reactionary it and it's making a you point need those, you need these political type that's what drama is for isn't it it's yeah. to tell these kind of stories and it's not to be like oh Jonathan Morris wrote this thing he can never work well, again but the trouble is right is he could have just told a story about a bunch of slug it could have been the slug yeah. monsters from yeah, but science what are they fiction, called in the twin dilemma uh, gastropods <laughs> no gastropods gastropods yeah you said grass <laughs> um yeah, it could have just been the gastropods, but because he makes them asylum seekers, because he, he they go about invading mm. in a very quiet and insidious way, it means we're having this conversation. I think it's good to have these conversations. That's what science fiction's for. That's what every science fiction yeah, story but... has some kind of 
narrative on But Mark, you couldn't have this society conversation about any big Finnish stories society. that have come out in the last ten years. No. They're not, they're it's got not a bit bland, doesn't in it? In fact, I feel since Cardiff sort of stepped in, they've well, no, stopped being reactionary. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is going good things. But it's worthy, probably it's, I think it's, it's the a weakest worthy of the experiment. Three. I think but it's the it is, weakest. It is of weak. Three. Yeah, even with Mel Bonnie Langford, it still doesn't. Oh, she's she, hilarious. She brings a bit of energy to it, but it's still it's not the best Mel story. No, although I am reliably informed that Stephen Alexander has out there somewhere on the internet written the story all about the spaceship Pinto and the <laughs> Doctor and Mel attempting to quell the quarks. <laughs> what shall we do next? Well, I suggest we head to Twitter. And have a conflab with our fabulous hoes. And may we say, for every single comment <laughs> that you give, we come in our pants just a little bit. Just a <laughs> little bit, all right? So thank you for every comment, you wonderful hoes. Uh, right, Rod Who? Is that Rod Who, Rod Brown from Strictly Come Hamster? It is. Okay. says, all three demonstrate a real commitment to telling new and different types of stories while simultaneously playing with form and structure. As such, they represent extremely positive and successful experimentation with what's possible. For me, this is golden era of Big Finish. I mean, did you hear how smart that critique was? Oh, very, That's yeah. why he's co-host of Strictly Come Hamster. Yeah. It brings all the smiles. Yep. Um, Ed Watkinson. Oh, I don't recognise that name. Is he handsome? Oh, Ed, you ask, what's he reading? Excuse me a second. Well, he says it's Lundbarra. Creatures of Beauty oh, he's got is a, a new classic, oh, he's got a, a story that adventure. can only be told on oh, audio, Why? reminiscent of Natural History of Fear. Oh. I suppose it could only be done on audio. Not well, reminiscent no. for us, because we ain't got there yet. I don't know if it could only be done on audio. What, of Creatures of Beauty? Yeah. It would be hard to tell that on the TV. No, I, I, well, I saw you it could all do in it my as a head. Book. You could I, do it as a book, but it'd be more like a choose-your-own-adventure. I saw all the visuals when I was um, listening, so I've seen it. Okay, well, why don't you it write that script? It looked amazing. Prove to us all yeah. that it could be made on the television. We do know a television producer, you know, Dylan Weiss. <laughs> we can maybe get that made. Creatures of Beauty, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, big ho time. Who is it? Luke Malloy. It is. Oh, <laughs> That's all I've got to say. Oh, my God. <laughs> big ho time. However, although it's not too much for ho. We met him recently, and there was no hoeing going down. But in terms of big Finnish ho, or rather, Finnish big ho. The opinions are ho, as big as a ho. He is a ho, yeah. <laughs> right. Pure he says, ho. Creatures of Beauty is Briggs's masterpiece. Yes. Yes, it is. A jigsaw structured tight thriller. A, a tight <laughs> don't don't <laughs> he knows a thing or two about a tight thriller <laughs> <laughs> truly subverting all Doctor Who tropes <sighs> that part three cliffhanger and all resolved with a simple crushing ending he, he's attempted this many times since and never got close failed dismally there's only one thing I can say about that critique what beauty 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 <laughs> beauty beautiful beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Dave Rennie Ah, oh, Dave, can you do it in a Scottish accent, please? Oh, I've got. Oh no, I can't. In Dave's oh, Scottish I'm, accent. Okay, sorry, right. Dave. But you've got to mention the, the Rebel Flesh as well because he likes that story. <laughs> I'm doing my best Scottish. Here we go. <clears throat> I think flip flop. No, the... stop. <laughs> Just read it. Just read it. <laughs> <laughs> I think flip flop is one of the most underrated early big finishes. Oh, really? Why? I think it's rather clever. Oh. Creatures is a genius story. It a is. story that rewards repeated it is. listens. Yeah, actually. You could to listen again and again. You could get more out of it in terms of being more familiar with I'd what's going on. I'd say the only one of these three that you wouldn't really have to listen to again is the middle one. But yeah. the other two, you're going to get more out of repeat mm. listeners. Yes. And Project <clears throat> Lazarus is pretty good too, with a shocking ending. <clears throat> no, that's not the ending. That's well, the middle ending. One of the endings. Okay. No more tears. Okay. Uh, Jim Allenby. Ah, lovely Jim. Creatures is the best of the three. Clever and one of Briggs's best scripts. Oh, look at this Nicholas Briggs love. Don't you come at us saying that Finnish Big <laughs> is shitting all over Nicholas Briggs all the time. Oh, what an image. <laughs> oh, don't. What happened with that glass table again? <laughs> In the Dollar Empire one. Now, when I anyway. tell that story, I'll be thinking of him under the table. <laughs> Flip. <laughs> Flip flop is an interesting idea, but has largely been forgotten. Yeah, well, yeah, it has been forgotten. Yeah. One, it's Christmas, and two, the it's, it's sort of asylum seeker it's stuff. Politically incorrect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lazarus is entertaining, but fails as a sequel. Oh, the death oh. of Cassie is cruel and disgusting. Fails as a sequel. 
Cruel and disgusting, did he say? Mm. That's why it's so dramatic. Doctor, where's Cassie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Gillipsy Pratt. No, it's Gillespie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you always get this wrong. Gillespie Gillespie Pratt. Pratt. I'm so sorry. Oh, I said with one of the previous batches of stories that Big Finish were being bold and innovative. Mm-hmm. And that continues here, if with more mixed results. Mm-hmm. We've got two novel ways of telling a story followed by a different take on a multi-doctor story. Yeah? Yeah, I agree with all mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. Darren Lit Roundels. He, he likes to be a bit contentious, Darren, so I'm looking forward to this. Flip Flop is the only one I had of these, and I really enjoyed it. Mm. It's been a while since I heard it. I recall it hurt my head to think about, but I know it made sense. If you so, know a disabled person or an asylum seeker, I suggest you don't <laughs> give this a listen again. Sylvester and Bonnie are really strong, Bonnie especially. Underrated. Oh, oh there you go. That's a different vote, day. vote for Flip Flop. Mm. That's like the Green Party votes, isn't it? You know, but it, it has. It ain't really got much of an impact, but we're pleased it's there. But it's been a while since he heard it, so if he so heard it again, he might not say that. That's, That's true. What I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, James H. Oh, this will be contentious. Come on, Creatures of Beauty. Four... Oh, let me guess. He hates it. Four episodes of sadism. Ah! With the least surprising <laughs> twist ever. The hideous the least mutants... surprising twist ever. For hideous mutants, they all speak with exceptionally plummy voices, yeah. and the editing style fades to hide a tediously repetitive capture, escape, repeat plot. See, I sort of agree in the terms if you did put it in order, it would just be that. Ooh, so I do it would agree. Be simple. I do agree. Yeah. One of the worst they did to this point. <gasps> I mean, I don't agree with that. I, mean, I think it's one of the best. Mm, no, but you know, everybody's know. entitled to their opinion. Has he heard I, Ravagers? <laughs> I often find, you know, if, say, fan opinion is a... You know, like when you have one of those big waves, mm. you know, that's heading towards the town and murder everybody. Yeah. yeah. But he's the one person standing there going against the wave, going, no, <laughs> I with fan opinion, but I love him for it. Cy Hart? Oh, come on, Cy. What you got for us? Creatures of Beauty was an unremarkable story made slightly more remarkable by it being played at random across the CDs. You've got to remember, he doesn't really like these uh, fatalistic stories. He, he prefers like a, you know, a fun adventure. I wasn't hugely, hugely impressed, despite a great cast. Mm. Flip Flop was an incredible piece of storytelling across the two CDs, offering a circular story that paid off either way you listened. My awesome ex, Dan, was awesome as the Slither G's oh, oh, dear. oh dear Dan you better watch out <laughs> alright playing oh. one of those evil asylum seekers <laughs> coming along oh taking offence to everything he could get on the front of take a break great. no no it was a great performance though. <laughs> I went out with a Slither G <laughs> <laughs> full story on Sci-hot page 3 spectacular <laughs> yeah oh god I dated a sentient slug <laughs> Well, I wonder if he did that voice when they were making love. Oh, no. Oh, oh yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. and he says, let's get back to the space yeah. yacht Pinto and quell the quarks. Oh, hurrah. Project Lazarus was interesting. Two stories, one absolutely heartbreaking ending with Evelyn. Yes. Incredible. Don't do it again. Right, Chris Hogburn. Oh, hey. hello, Chris. Anything to do with the Forge series is fantastic. Project Lazarus is not the comfy adventure you're expecting. Not true. <laughs> it's not. An idea that the story expands, twists, and shows consequences of the Doctor's actions. You know what? Project Lazarus opens like it's going to be sort of a fabulous folk cryptozoologist yeah, adventure, you know, the, trying to find that they? creature. Hoothry. And it becomes a horrible well, nightmare, hoothry. doesn't it? Yeah. That's it's Six tragedy. and Evelyn, What's Not to Love. That's it's my favourite of the three. Ah, oh. what? Project Lazarus? Yeah. Well, there we go. So there's a bit of love for everything here. Yeah. Gary Russell. Uh, oh, oh, the big cheese! He's getting his waders in. Come on, All Gary. three of them are great examples of the kind of diverse storytelling I thought that would demonstrate the uniqueness that audio brings in a way visual arts cannot. Did your voice deliberately go a bit camp then? No. <laughs> <laughs> CF, Whispers of Terror, Live 34, Night Thoughts, Omega, and many more. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree, and I agree that when he chipped and... out of the show, Joey's last main range was Year of the Pig. He was oh, experimenting oh right till the end. And also, it could be so easily just to rest and be rest on your CD yeah, cases, just, just, yeah. and you know, well, yeah, that's do what I your... do now. <laughs> <laughs> just do your traditional four-part story, yeah. Push them out. You could easily do your, you know, like your whispers of. Te- well, Whispers of Terror was different, <clears throat> but you do your Slums of Time or, you know, those ones. But to constantly be coming up, because that workload must have been so heavy and the turnaround on all of these and actually to put that effort in 
to make something original and different yeah, every yeah, yeah. single month. Like the the you know. equivalent of resting on your laurels now is oh I know River Song Jackie Tyler and the Crotons. Yeah. Or Vienna oh the Master and the Axons. Irresistible. You know. I mean I I want to hear both <laughs> those stories, but I'm fairly certain they're not going to innovate well, in the way these do. They're usually irresistible till you hear them and then they're not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's the well that's what you said about a flip flop. Best thing it was was getting it in the post. Well, it... <laughs> and then the worst thing was putting it in the player. <laughs> James Lark. Oh, James. Oh, we're going to his symphonia next week. Oh, is that really? Yeah. Oh. They're right. all admirably... I can't say Hold on. They're all admirably. They're all admirably... <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. I can't say it. Hold on. They're all admirably experimental <laughs> in different ways, and I think all successful as well. But to be honest, I don't find any of them an enjoyable listen. I can, oh, I can, no, no, I can understand that because they're all pretty dark. Oh, um, hang on, he carries on. He's, can I just said say that Mark them. has just attempted to say the word admirably about fifteen times. You I, don't hear that, but I do. Sorry, everyone. I'm, people are like replying to their own tweets with more things, so I'm trying to. Anyway, he says they can do that, you know. Yeah, I know, but I'm not seeing them all. Hmm. Creatures is so bleak, and I fear some of the structural jiggery pokery is for its own sake rather than in aid of the story. Ooh, I'm not convinced the final twist is sufficiently well delivered to reward all the concentration it requires. Or maybe I just need to concentrate harder. See, it does need concentration. I do agree on that. Mm-hmm. Project Lazarus is also bleak, though much as you'd expect with a sequel to Project Twilight. It does feel like a bit of a retread in order to further punish its characters, including the leads. Worth it for Colin's performance, but grim. It is grim. It is. And Flip Flop, it works, doesn't it? It's definitely clever, but it's a pretty dour scenario. And once you've worked out the device, the second episode, either way around, inevitably becomes a bit boring because you know what's coming. Flip Flop also begs the question, what's the point? Cleverless aside, what do we gain from having the choice of which disc to play first? It's hardly opening up limitless possibilities <laughs> or, and this is the crux of the problem giving us a wildly different experience each time. I applaud Big Finish pushing the envelope and doing some unique and unusual things with the format but perhaps the next three could just be some damn good character dramas grounded in fantastic performances rather than gimmicks Do you know what right? I disagree with some of the things he said there but he's such a smart cookie and he delivers his argument mm. with such passion and integrity yeah. I'm afraid I can't disagree no. with anything he said there. That's true. <laughs> we agree with you entirely you don't get a different story that is true and we are looking forward to your symphonia Gareth Bowley Project Lazarus was a good play on the multi-doctor story Colin's performance in the later episodes is unsettling at his realisation of his existence Mm, that's good. Yeah. It's given Colin is stretching it out. <laughs> Didn't we say that? No, I can't handle Colin being naked <laughs> and stretched out in the same episode. All right. Uh, Marius writes says I enjoyed the twist in seeing both the sixth Doctor and seventh Doctor in the story, Project Lazarus and the seventh Doctor. Just realised I repeat to myself, oof the tiredness. Okay, forget that. <laughs> Hang on, sorry. Did you go, oof? <laughs> yeah. Oof, oof the tiredness. Toy maker's cat. Oh, <laughs> meow. <laughs> Ooh, yay. Been waiting for the next monthly instalment. Bit of a mixed bag. <sighs> Two of these are very much experimenting with format, with even Lazarus doing a split story. Been a while since I heard Creatures, but the main thing I remember is the clever way it's told in order to make the chronological beginning of the story the ending. Then there's the Lazarus opening. Two parts, which are great, but I feel drifts off a little for me personally in the last two parts. We agreed on that, didn't we? But I do love the Doctor playing Moonlight Sonata on the piano. Oh, he does at the beginning, doesn't yeah. he? Sylvester so McClay. Isn't there a, a bit where he goes, yes, I remember getting lessons from Elton John. Yeah, and I, I know. Think, I wrote down in my notes, Sylvester McCoy and Elton John. <laughs> <laughs> playing the spoon. <laughs> and I've got to say, <laughs> congratulations on you, by the way, becoming John Pertwee for these comments, because you kept saying, Lazarus. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> anyway. Keep that bit in, please. <laughs> Hold on, the only thing I don't agree with is Evelyn not forgiving the Sixth Doctor, which we know she does eventually, making Seventh's comment here untrue. Oh, yeah, because he says, he does that wistful, yeah. yes, she never did forgive me. But, terrible acting, but they didn't know about arrangements for war at that point, no. so fair enough. I think they would have known about arrangements for war, this would have been planned. Well, that's what, two years ahead. Mm, I don't know. We've got a lot of Eighth Doctor to get through before we get there. A flip-flop, the trailer you were always embarrassed to listen to because of what sounds like sex noises. 
I'd rather have spent time with the quarks, but this is a very clever circular story where I do like the premises. Premises. <laughs> Matt Dennis. Hello, Matt. A new name. Hello. All perfectly serviceable. <laughs> oh, Anyone who starts with all perfectly serviceable, you know this is not going to be glowing. But these are ultimately just average stories, slightly enlivened by unorthodox narrative structures. Lazarus is probably the best. I'm really paranoid about I say Lazarus now. No, sounds perfect. Madam, is this project Lazarus? <laughs> Lazarus imagine is probably. Bro- <laughs> imagine John Bowie in the forge. Oh my god. Coffee! The forge, Coffee! <laughs> Damn you, Nimrod! <laughs> Lazarus is probably the best, as the events therein at least set up some good drama for Evelyn and Sixie in the next story. Mm. True. Longdon Calling. London calling, hello! Yeah. Creatures of Beauty is still one of my favourite big finishes. Your ah. review of it got me into it, actually. My review? Well, it can't be this one because we've recorded it, so it must be Dako Hull's review. Oh, thank you, Longdon calling, for reading those. Mm. What did you give it on Dako Hull? Oh, ten secret. out of ten. Oh, you've done it now. Dako Hull's coming up soon, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> After the break. Plus, my secret <laughs> identity has now been revealed. <laughs> <laughs> well, Igloo, Igloo Blogger. Igloo Blogger? Igloo Blogger is that his says. Name? Creatures of Beauty was really good. Very much enjoyed the structure of the story. Mm. Loved Project Lazarus. I really like it when multi-doctor stories have an interesting way where the Doctor can meet themselves. Mm-hmm. But it sort of is a cop-out, isn't it? Because it's a clone. But anyway. Uh, we have uh, TWWASC, which is the Whovian with a small collection, I think. What? I just want a chance to say hello and thank always you comments on for our... all your comments yes, on the YouTube we videos. We do absolutely appreciate it. I love getting them, reading it. them. Yes. Yeah. In fact, he wrote a fabulous essay, you know, mm. on our Children of the Future one. Yeah. Or was it the Lots of thoughts, one? all of them. So many thoughts. So many opinions. The Hoovian with a small collection. Thank I'm you. I'm glad someone else has listened to all of these. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's not just one person. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, if we well, had one view, ones. I'd be very scared. Well, I listen to all these at work back to back. What? Is uh... that Big Finishes or ours? I think these stories, these three oh, stories. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ego. Creatures of Beauty, I would say, <clears> is the one I regret not giving my fullest attention to. Yeah. You, I don't think you could do this while you're working. No. Flip Flop is most definitely a flop. Well, I wouldn't disagree. I can't believe no one's actually used that no, before <laughs> either. Why do we think of that? <laughs> and do you know what? We'd tell you if it was a flip, because yeah. she's marvellous. Yeah. So we'll say it's a flop. And Project Lazarus is so fucking heartbreaking. Yeah. Don't do it. Oh, We've no. had it enough now. Oh, no. <laughs> um, Sarah April Patton says, Flip Flop is one of my all-time faves. Oh. Mm. Love the fact whichever side you play leaves a different ending in the fate of the planet it is set in. Mm. I mean, because it could be called Circular Time in a way, couldn't it? It could. <laughs> they didn't think of Circular Time at the time. Or oh, Circular Plot, Flip Flop really. is a bit of a funny name for it, isn't it? Circular no Plot. Flip Do flop. you like wearing flip flops? No. I find it a bit uncomfortable. No. Plus, you know when Frobisher walks around and you hear those blop, 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 mm. That's what it sounds like. And people on the beach is really annoying. Andy Chisholm? Who? Andy Chisholm? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Andy Chisholm because I think that's spelt like the same as Mel C from Spice Girls <clears throat> yeah, okay. Melanie Chisholm hello Andrew <laughs> possibly related to Mel C mm-hmm. Creatures of Beauty has really grown on me over the years I bought Flip Flop on release but still have not got to the end of it <laughs> Lazarus has Nimrod and an unusual twist in the second disc when did yeah. this come out? 2003 <laughs> yeah, and he still hasn't doing? got to the end of it <laughs> bloody hell that's 20 years that is a damning indictment of Flip Flop Ken Moss Oh, Ken, who's doing my fabulous audio recordings oh, for my book him. club. Creatures of Beauty rewards the listener for four episodes of WTF with the very last line that slots the entire jigsaw into place. Is that beautiful, 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 beauty, 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 or is that... Hello, no, Nissa, I don't think we had any I think it might, effect yeah. on this planet whatsoever. Wonderful stuff. Certainly not one for anyone who isn't an audiophile, but unfortunately kills any re-listen value with its own cleverness. Oh, I, can't, I hate to contradict mm. you, but we did re-listen to this this week, and I found it very mm. enjoyable. Project Lazarus was a worthy follow-up to Twilight, some great imagery, mm. and the BF continual linking of Sixth and Seventh Doctors during this period really pays off. Worthy. That's a good word for it, isn't it? My biggest issue is capitalising the entire story title on the CD spine. It doesn't match the rest. What? Uh, oh, oh don't, God. Ken! Why Dude. did you tell him that? <laughs> why what did you, you tell him? Oh shit! <laughs> I've never noticed that before. Oh, oh look. no! 
Honestly, I mean, I, this is somebody I don't think, who no, needs things matter. to line up no, on a bookshelf. No, I'm not bothered about that, but I've just never noticed Thanks, that Ken. That's all I'm going to hear about wow. now. Um, he also says, Flip Flop is amazingly clever writing, not because of the circular story, but because it skewers the downsides of political correctness so hard that I'm not surprised no one ever talks about it. You would never get away with this now, certainly not that cringy sex scene. I'm glad, yeah, yeah no. I'm glad somebody brought that up. Well, we talked about that, no. but yeah, I'm no. glad somebody brought that up. We got Mono Cheto One. What these three stories in particular have in common is that the Doctor loses. It's less apparent in Flip Flop because it's a sidestep for another adventure, but that planet got stuck in a time loop because of him, with both outcomes being bad. Mm. Interesting. Well, yeah, but it's not less impactful in Creatures of the Beauty because they don't even realise. <laughs> Reese Hollow, Flip Flop is my favourite big finish. Oh my god, so much love for Flip Flop. Mm. Very clever and would love to see this type of story on TV. Great stuff. Well, minus the sex scene, I hope. How would you tell this story on TV? Oh, let me unwrap my Christmas present. No, that's just oh. every day with you. But no, how would you tell this story on TV? Oh, it's the same. Two isn't episodes, it? Yeah, you and could just do have a them. great tracking shot with, you know, like in Father's Day where there's two of them and two of them. It would be like that, wouldn't it? You'd have two lots of. Seven of Doctor and Mel's running around. I suppose around. it's a bit like the arc, isn't it? Where at the end you think yeah. it's the end of the adventure and then mm. it's a continuation. Matt V, Creatures of Beauty, challenging, but not in a way most people say it is. The structure isn't actually all that difficult to get your head around. No, but the true. violence is, and brutality is genuinely uncomfortable to listen to at points. Yes. Doctor Who has never felt so visceral. Mm-hmm. But well, I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm. I think it should be visceral every now and again. Flip Flop plays about with time in a clever way as to be expected from Morris. Shame that both sides of the story are messy and half-baked, with shallow characters and disturbingly anti-immigrant sentiment behind it. Yeah. I like what it's trying to be, not what it is. Project oh, Lazarus... I like what it's trying to be, but not is fabulous. Project Lazarus, the first half is solid, Nimrod is as captivating as he was in his first appearance, and Cassie's storyline is emotionally engaging. The second half bizarrely opts to drop all that in favour of a generic alien invasion storyline, a case of muddled priorities. Mm. Mm. What an intelligent critique there from Matt V. Yeah. King Peladon. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> King Peladon. <laughs> Creatures of Beauty is my favourite big finish play of all time. Granted, I've only heard about a dozen and a half. I just adore the five and Nissa combo, and the whole story is beautifully performed. Can I say beautiful, King, beautiful? Can I, King? Can I say I don't know where your stylist is, but your hair is absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Nobody, no one. Creatures of Beauty is a very strong tale, but I didn't connect with it as much as other people. Perhaps on a re-listen. Still, one of solo Nissa highs, though. Flip Flop has a good gimmick, but the plot is super boring and at times even offensive. Project Laz Lazarus <laughs> is great for Sixie. <laughs> Isn't nobody no one? The word Lord. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, a, B. Oh, we need it at the end. Yep. I really enjoyed <laughs> Flip Flop. It was one of my first big finish stories and I found the whole list in any order thing fascinating and happily, mm -hmm. tie and happily tried both ways. <laughs> Whoa, did you know? It also made me think. I've tried both ways. <laughs> Only one way stuck, though. <laughs> it also made me think more stories should examine the consequences of the Doctor's actions on time, deliberate or otherwise. See, that's why I said. <gasps> he put that on comment time. in for a reason, no. didn't he? No, we was going to read these out. Project Lazarus is my favourite of the lot. Oh, this is Alan Hughes, by the way. Oh, hello, Alan Doctor Hughes. Doctor Who's vampires are one of the best villains <laughs> that have been expanded upon in the spin off tales. Yeah, Doctor and vampires have got a strong mm. history. I've just re read Vampire Science recently a myself. Of, a lot of sucking going on in Doctor oh, Who. Yeah. Um, Thomas Stringfellow. <laughs> Thomas Stringfellow. <laughs> Hello, sir. <laughs> I doff my cap to you, Thomas Stringfellow. <laughs> Creatures of Beauty, a masterpiece that people don't talk about enough. Atmospheric, unsettling, and bleak. Perfect. Flip flop. I could almost enjoy the cool, cynical nature of the story if it wasn't for the. Gross levels of anti-immigration and xenophobia themes. Project Laz is good. Project Laz. Project Laz. Okay. <laughs> Where are well, we going the next? Comments, right? Uh, what do you want to do? Well, I think we should head well, back to a review blog back in the day. Okay. Known as Duck or Hole. <laughs> Creatures of Beauty, 
Docker Hope was very impressed with this one. He says, One of the cleverest things about this story is how it sets up its consequences before rewarding its dilemmas. Mm -hmm. I think Docker Hope got in his flow of sounding pretentious at this point. Um, he also says, Briggs has hit upon a formula that really makes Nissa work. Put her in the worst situation imaginable. It does, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, and then he also says, What has happened to Nick Briggs? Since he took a break from the main range to write and direct Dalek Empire, his handling of stories has been masterful. It's true. Don't overwork people. To be fair, that's the only thing Nick Briggs hasn't done with Big Finish is play the master. Or has he? Oh, I'm sure he has at some sure point. Probably, has there's to. an audio visuals out there somewhere <laughs> writing in someone's basement. Project Lazarus. Well, well, well. That was a surprise. After a garbled, confused and almost redundant performance in his last three stories, we finally have Sylvester McCoy returning to Doctor Who. <laughs> God, I really didn't like McCoy, did I, back in the day? I've totally done a 180 on him. The next one is just three words. Evelyn's Tears. Horrible. <laughs> what are you going to remember that? Uh, finally, lots of fantastic ideas squeezed into a story that doesn't have breathing space to handle them all. Well, Doctor Ho hasn't really changed that much of an opinion. No, but um, I, unfortunately, I have dire news what? for our Finnish Big Hoes and you. What? The flip flop review on Doctor Ho reviews. Does not exist. Well, you never wrote it. I never ever wrote Why one. Why not? I think maybe I just didn't want to go through the task of having to pull it apart. Really? It was That's so, so complicated. Unusual. So I'm surprised because they people used to email me all the time saying, "You haven't written a review for this." Yeah, that's really right, unusual. For that. And I would write back and go, "It's free fucking content, you know. If I want to take a break, I will." <laughs> anyway. Doc Ho was very impressed overall, I'd say. Well, let's go on to some chronology moments. Mark's chronology moments. So, Preach the Beauty. Another Fifth Doctor and Nyssa. Really easy. Straight after Spare Parts. So we're just carrying on their run okay. in release order. There's nothing here to suggest otherwise. Why not? Okay, well, I mean, what a great run. Yep. Spare Parts has started the season, Yeah. followed by Creatures of Beauty, and then the game. Well, yeah, not there yet. But, I know. But, um, and then we have Project Lazarus now. Yeah, this, this is tough. Well, two Doctors? No, yes, but it's two stories. So oh, who takes priority? Do, well, no, so the first two episodes are going to go in the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn run. After Doctor Who and the Pirates? After Doctor Who and the Pirates that we last had. Before because, Arrangers Because we War? need the the death of Jem and everything to sort of build up in of terms of the storyline yeah. and we also have is this the first time we've had the Sixth Doctor's blue coat to mention because yes. he's blue coat on the front it is. so it finally is. we have blue coat we have real time though already yes I know but we hadn't had it in the audio referenced no so now we can have real time uh, it's not referenced in the pirates, is it? It's ref it's got his coloured coat in the pirates. Yeah. So we well, want real time pirates. Was never followed up either. So real time. So I'm going to put real time after Project Lazarus for now. Okay. And then we'll have to see because we're going to have to push that further down the line, aren't we? Well, I hope you make peace with your deities for doing that. Um, and then we have the two episodes with Sylvester McCoy which he's on his own yeah. so I'm going to put it after Sirens of Time which is funny because then you've got all these team ups next to each other so we, there's, there's more solo Sylvester McCoy the next McCoy, one's though. not until like Frozen Time oh no we added uh, sorry we added future. Excellus didn't we oh no Mastery's on his own we've added Excellus as well yes um, so I'm going to put it before Excellus so Sirens of Time Project Lazarus and Excellus Excellus decays yeah and then Master oh, we'll find well, we'll out see. when we get we'll there see. okay because well it is that TV movie Seventh Doctor on the front as well isn't it and how about Flip Flop Flip Flop so season 24 we've had a few haven't we and the last one we had was Bang Bang A Boom which was very mm. silly yeah. and we put that really early on and we put, like after Paradise you Towers you put Father Vulcan later later because that's a bit more towards serious towards Dragonfly I mean in this here the Doctor isn't that silly getting metaphors mixed up no. version although McCoy was clearly doing a bit of sight reading it's sort of middle of the season so I'm going to put it before Fires of Vulcan just before Fires of Vulcan just before Fires of Vulcan oh, okay. and after Derek and the Bannermen so it's a bit Fair later enough. on in the run 
Okay. And, and there we go. That's God, simple. Just I three added. these extra Doctor and Mel stories are making season 24 the best thing ever. Well, there's a lot of them, actually. Imagine there's watching tons. Time and the Rani and then listening to Bang Bang A Boom. I, I mean, know. amazing. <laughs> okay. Well, we only have one last thing to do. So we've got three questions each. Off Who's you going go. first? Go on, you okay. Go. So, which actors in Creatures of Beauty have played characters in the television series? There's three. Three? Yeah. Well, obviously David Dacre. Yeah, which I stories? Ron in Time Warrior, and he's also in Nightmare of Eden. That's right. The Empress has eaten your ship. <laughs> Who cares? They're only economy class. You actually mentioned somebody while we were listening to it. No, I, I don't know. I don't oh, know. Eh, eh. So Michael Smiley is in there, who has got a very distinctive voice, and he's in Into the Dalek. Oh, well, I wouldn't know that. I don't like And that. Gemma Churchill oh, yes. is in it, and she is the old woman in Village of the Angels. Wow! So there you go. And the old man in Village of the Angels is Tarpok from Warriors of the Deep. <laughs> Prestige casting in the Chibnall era. Yeah. Well, there we go. That's Creatures of Beauty in the movie, right there, isn't it? What's your first Mar- question? Oh, my question. What is my question? Um. Oh, who was originally cast as Gilbrook? Oh, I know this. It's quite a big name, isn't it? Yeah, and it was all sorted out, and it was very last minute that it changed, and we got David oh, Dacre instead. I did read this, and I can't remember. Tell me. Clive Swift. Oh, he wouldn't have been as good as David Dacre. Oh, he would have had that horribleness, though, to oh, him, wouldn't he? would have been he? sleazy as hell, I mean, they're both they? just as good, but imagine him being like that to Nissa, like... I think David Dacre's performance of that is one of the best we've had so yeah. far. It, I mean, he is... Ugly. I don't mean mm. David Dacre's no. ugly. <laughs> well. I mean he's not afraid to make that character really yeah, but ugly. But I think Clive Swift would have done that as well. Ah, oh, does make me think. No, no, no. I'm sticking with David Dacre. Okay. So my second question then is, where did Kevin Scott and Mark Wright originally want to set Project Lazarus? In what time period? How far in the future? Oh. I. Mm. Well, it couldn't have been that far because of Cassie. Well, it doesn't make no sense, but this, there is... It is true. And Gary Russell said, no, it's got to be set now. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a sequel. Oh, I don't know, 25th century? <laughs> That's a bit far. Oh, right. <laughs> Cassie would still be alive then, would she? Oh, no. she's a vampire. Oh, she would. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it would still work, wouldn't it? Yeah. No, 70 years in the future. Oh, OK. That's not too bad. Mm. Um, OK. True or false... There was originally plans to have a Forge spin-off series featuring uh, Ace and Hex. True. Yes. Yeah, they should have done Imagine that. Imagine if that they had happened have later that. on. That see, back then they knew that how to do a spin-off. Really, that would have been that's good, so enticing. All those characters, those two. As I mean, well. there would be stories a bit like the Torchwood ones, wouldn't they? But yeah, but oh, this was before Torchwood was a thing. So, can we do it now? I think it, I think we've missed the boat on that. No, we? there's no way Sophie Wilder's going to say no to work. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> but I don't know. Forge is just a distant memory I haven't heard too now. much of who's that lovely, muscly guy with a nice bum, Philip Olivier. Yeah, yeah, yeah he done much work lately. He'd say yes too. Mm. He might have done a lot of work. Oh, no. He was in the last adventure, and we saw him recently in this fabulous gay short. What's the film's called? Boys on Film. <laughs> yeah. They're special. Or what, what are they? Short films from what? The though? Irish Prize. The Irish Festival. Yeah, the Irish Festival of Gay Films. <laughs> and Philip Olivia was in there, right? Oh, the performance was terrible. But he did snog well. It was a good storyline. A shocking yeah. ending on that one as well. He died, didn't he? Yeah. Just like Hex. <laughs> <laughs> no, he killed the guy. Oh, he did kill the guy, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, check it out. We don't know what it okay. was called. Question. <laughs> Question. The line, the quarks go berserk and explode is inspired from which Doctor Who album? Album? Yes. The quartz it's literally the name of a track on an album. Oh, the Radiophonic Workshop sound effects. Yes, that is right. <laughs> it's called Quarks Go Berserk and Explode. Well, that's and what like, happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, um, my question for Flip Flop is name the other audio story that the Slither Jews turn up in. Oh, you told me this. It's the Vienna one, isn't it? Um, the Shadow Heart. No, the first, it's the first one, the Memory Box. Oh, are they not in the Sylvester McCoy one? 
No, that's no. I'm talking about the Vienna series. Ah, oh, okay. Are they now? Are they? Yeah. Oh, that's nowadays. You wouldn't think they'd be bringing them back nowadays. I don't think they're a big part. Evil but there is asylum liturgy. seekers. <laughs> There we go. I don't know who won that. I think we, no. we we never do very well, do we? How would you find as a conclusion for those three stories? I'd say the best is Creatures from Beauty, the second best is Project Lazarus, and the weakest is Flip Flop. But I think there is interesting things to listen to and discuss in all three. Yeah, I would put them in that order as well. I'm very pleased they're experimenting. Yes. And I know we're not doing the main range again next, but oh, we're going to set a very experimental range Oh, next. of course. I've just remembered. I was trying to remember then. But what the we're next going three to. main range stories are huge Well, we're heading towards... Well. It's the 40th anniversary celebration. I mean, this whole year is brilliant. 2004... No, 2003 mm. is a really good year. Can we just say that um, I do, in fact, think that Gary Russell is a better showrunner than Stephen Moffat. Oh, Moffitt Gary Russell because every day. Gary Russell led up to the 40th anniversary. What was, was the greatest? The biggie, yeah? Yeah. It led up to that with all of these amazing stories. Davros, Master, Creatures of Beauty, Pirates, and Stephen Moffat led up to Day of the Doxa with, well, Season 7B. <laughs> <laughs> Which was ghastly. I know, I know. <laughs> right, well, Although so take... some people will probably say Day of the Doctor was a better payoff than Zagreus. Probably not you. No, I love Zagreus. <laughs> some people would. It's got Ace in it as a duck. <laughs> <laughs> To Mr. McCoy as a poem. Okay, we got, we're not there yet, but we'll talk I about that. I can't wait to do oh it. Oh my god. The day where we get to the greatest. You know that what, is one right? on its own, isn't it? Do you know it? the previously on bit is yeah. eight minutes long? I know, but there's no <laughs> lot going on. Anyway, I'm going to say, before we go, what we're talking about next. Ah, uh, and we've got a special guest star coming on. We have. So, the next three, we, we're going to do in the Unbound series. Yeah. So, we're doing the first three releases there. So interesting. And they are Old Mortality. Is that what it's called? That's Jeffrey Bowden. Fabulous. Sympathy for the Devil. That's David Warner. Fabulous. And Full Fathom 5. That's David Collins. Fabulous. You know what's really sad? We've lost them all. All those three Apart amazing actors. Caroline Ford, yeah. Well, she's, is she the only one alive in, this, in all the other? I, I don't want. I certainly don't want her to pass, but I wouldn't mind losing her in the acting stage. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But what an intriguing series this is! I only really know the first one. I've not really listened to the second two very well. So I'll say this because Dylan's going to be doing all six of us. We're going to do them as two episodes because there's a lot to cover. Oh I think the first three, from memory, are great. And the last three are a bit mixed. What's the guy called Badger in the first one, isn't it? It's Badger. Badger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Grandfather, are you at home? But um, we've pulled in Dylan Reese from Too Hot for TV for this one because his podcast deals with the most obscure Doctor Who spin offs, and there's nothing more obscure than a load of Doctor Who that, that shouldn't aren't exist. Doctor Who, yeah. It doesn't exist. <laughs> <Boop>. <laughs> well, in the meantime. Yes. Remember to... Oh, you remember to... Finish... finish.